Good evening, good afternoon even. Um, so that's not where I wish the day away quite yet, the evening it is yet young. Thank you so much for being here at the British Library and to everybody watching today's uh, day of talks from the British Library online around the world. It's great to have you all with us. Um, we have a wonderful programme here today. Obviously, many of you have been here since the start, and I hope you've also had the opportunity maybe today or during the uh, last few weeks or up to the end of February to see our exhibition Fantasy Realms of the Imagination, uh, which uh, I hope you find a fascinating and rich uh, experience um, covering manuscripts from uh, everything, the Beowulf and Alice manuscripts to uh, Ursula Le Guin, Neil Gaiman and so on and so forth. It is a, it's a real journey of discovery. Um, today we're obviously welcoming amazing writers and artists from all around the world. Uh, we had Charles Vest flew in, uh, we've got Rebecca Kwong who's flown in, and with today's panel have all, all lived together in Devon in the same village, which I, I who, who knew? <laughs> So we're absolutely delighted that just coming to the stage at the moment will be Alan Lee, Brian and Wendy Froud, and chairing them today is T Terry Windling, who's, who's an amazing editor, writer of more than 40 books, 10 World Fantasy Awards, Lifetime Achievement in a, a Fantasy Award, uh, and much more besides. Um, she is also uh, one of the advisory panel of the Fantasy Exhibition, and also lives in the same village in Devon. So please welcome to the stage. <laughs> Well, when they say we all live together, <laughs> you might want to clarify. <laughs> oh, thank you for that lovely introduction, John. And thank you all for coming out today to join us in talking about how to visualize fantasy, how to turn magical worlds, um, to conjure magical worlds, and the magic in this world, both for books and for film and television. I'm going to briefly introduce my three companions here. Um, it's true we did all come up from Devon last night on the train. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this, this introduction to each of them is so ridiculously brief because their careers span years <coughs> and they've done amazing things. And if I listed everything, we'd, be, we'd go through all of our panel time. So just in case you don't already know who they are, which I'm sure you do, Alan Lee is a book artist and film designer best known for his illustrations for J.R.R. Tolkien's books and his conceptual designs for Peter Jackson's adaptations of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He's an, also illustrated many other fine books from The Mabinogian, Peter Dickinson's Merlin Dreams, and Rosemary Sudcliffe's The Black Ships of Troy, to The Wanderer and other old English poems, and of course, the hugely influential book Fairies in collaboration with Brian Froud. He's won the Kate Greenaway, Greenaway Medal for illustration, an Academy Award for film design, and many other honors. Brian Froud is a book artist and film designer best known for his many books exploring the realms of fairy, for his designs in collaboration with Jim Henson on the films The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and for the Dark Crystal television series The Age of Resistance. He's created many other magical books, worked on other magical films, and is rightly considered the leading expert on fairy lore in Britain today. He's won the Hugo Award, the World Fantasy Award, the Spectrum Award, the Life Achievement Award from the Society of Illustrators, and numerous other honors. Wendy Froud is a sculptor, puppet designer, doll artist, and writer best known for her work on the, with Jim Henson on The Muppet Show, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, and for fabricating the original prototype for Yoda for The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> she has published numerous books in collaboration with her husband, Brian, as well as her own Old Oak Wood series for children and The Art of Wendy Froud. Her published writing includes texts for Trolls, Fairy Tales, Madeline Coddington's Press Fairies Diary, and her most recent film and television work was on The Dark Crystal, The Age of Resistance. So welcome to all three of you. Um, the fact that we all live in the same little Dartmoor <laughs> village is actually significant to our talk today. One of the things that um, you may have noticed about the fantasy exhibition is that the curators have gone to great lengths to show how 
Fantasy is a community, a, a community of overlapping communities, artists, writers, filmmakers, gamers, readers, viewers, critics, scholars, all in conversation with each other, a conversation that has been going on for generations and centuries. And I think the, the exhibition shows that quite clearly. We're, we also are part of that large community, but our work is informed by this small physical community that we live in on the edge of Dartmoor in this powerful ancient mythic landscape. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and how that has influenced all the work that these three artists have done. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to just introduce yourselves in terms of your early lives, how you've discovered mythic and magical art, how you found your way to that as a vocation, and how you found your way to Dartmoor, starting with Alan. Right. <laughs> well, I, um, I discovered fairyland in Uxbridge <laughs> at a very, very early age, and specifically in Uxbridge um, Public Library. And uh, there was one book in particular, it's All Finch's Mythology, which had all the Greek myths and Arthurian stories and mm -hmm. some Celtic legends as well and um, that started me off on this kind of quest to read everything that I could on on folklore and, and fairy and myth and legend and I went through all the Oxford um, myths and legend series by uh, um, Barbara Leone Picard mm -hmm. and uh, and when I got to the end of that I started again and I just kind of completely immersed myself in that world and um, drawing was uh, the only thing I was ever any good at, really. So it just kind of naturally started to find expression through, the, through drawings and just kind of wandering around in the suburbs of, of, of Uxbridge and, and imagining um, all kinds of wonderful things kind of going on in the undergrowth. And, um, and that was when I started to read Tolkien, when I discovered Tolkien, and uh, obviously had a huge huge effect. Mm. Brian? Well, I was going to say something, and now I'm going to say something else, because that re reminded me when I was at school, uh, we had to do like um, public debating, and, and I, I went to the library and came across, I think, the same thing, the Bullfinch's mythology. Yeah. I thought, well, this is really interesting. And I, I chose all the bloodthirsty bits and talked yeah. about that, and, and, and won. <laughs> um, but then they accused me of stealing the book because the book <laughs> became really popular and disappeared. So uh, <laughs> got got me into it. But I, I started. I uh, went to art school and I thought I wanted to be a fine artist. And I spent a year doing that, which I found um, uh, not very satisfactory because I just found that people were painting, which I thought were rubbish pictures. <laughs> um, but it, but if you had a, a, a lapsed uh, explanation, um, you, you got by. And I thought this is all wrong. So I thought I would go and study graphic design. So I, I, waiting for my interview, I was in the library there, and I came across a book about Arthur Rackham. And that was a revelation. Um, and it, in particular, it was his trees that had faces in it and personality. And it just reminded me of what it was, how I felt as a child. Uh, and I went to a village school, and I spent all my time out in the woods, not, not in the playground, um, climbing up trees and going through the undergrowth. And, uh, and it just reminded me that nature had personality and in, in, in particular spirit. And so I, um, because of that, became really interested in fairy tales. Um, and I went through my three-year three -year course um, doing really boring <laughs> stuff. But at the weekends... Um, this is, that's, I've just realised how important this is, is, has been. I, I was still living with my parents, and I, I had a room in the roof. And I, only in the centre could I stand up. The rest of you had to sort of <laughs> hunker down. But I spent the whole weekends on my hands and knees drawing fairy tales. <laughs> um, and that's how I got started in it. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy? I got started um, because my parents were both artists, and uh, my father was a sculptor, my mother was a painter. And um, they were also great readers. My mother loved fairy tales. And she read to me from 
the time I was born, she always read to me, and she read um, all of the classic fairy tales to me. Then we read uh, C.S. Lewis. We, then she went on to Tolkien, and we read all of those. And even when I was absolutely able to read to myself, she would still say, no, 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 let me read it to you. And it was wonderful to hear her read. And it meant that I wanted to then live in those books when I was growing. I was an only child. And uh, I had dollhouse dolls to play with, but I, what I didn't have were figures like fauns and centaurs and satyrs and things to go with them, so I made them. And from the time I was about six, I made them out of old socks or pipe cleaners or whatever I could, and they would play with my little dollhouse dolls. And I created my own fantasy worlds there. Mm. And I remember I graduated from art college as well, and. Um, my teachers all said, because I was making dolls and figures, and they said, you're never going to make a living doing this. I said, no, this is, you know, really, you should just be a production potter. I said, no, I don't want to do that. And I didn't know what I would do, but I, then I came to New York and um, was hired by the Henson Company and hired by Jim Henson. For that. So really, I'm, mine was kind of a pretty straight path, but I had been with an old boyfriend, I had been to Chagford years before I met Brian or knew where it was, but we'd just gone down there to visit uh, friends in another village, stopped for a pint of beer, and I thought, oh, this feels like home. This is, this is where I would like to be. And lo and behold, I met Brian, and this is where he lived. And Alan, too, it was amazing. <laughs> I want to give this some context because we're talking about all of you came of age as artists in the 70s and we're talking about a time when fantasy as we know it today was did not exist. The fantasy field was mm. very small. It was pretty much frowned upon, you know, in, in universities and art schools to be interested in any of these things. Being interested in Rockham or Duloc as illustrators was very odd. And one had to really seek out other people and other, whether um, past artists who'd been involved in this kind of work or present artists doing this kind of work. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. So finding community, also we didn't have the internet. So finding community was not a small job. So in relation to that, how did you two, who you came down to Dartmoor first, how did you meet each other and get down there? Well, um, I'd, like Brian, I'd been to art school. I went to Ealing School of Art. And, um, and pretty soon after leaving, I started to work as an illustrator and had an agent, artist partners in Soho. And uh, Brian was on their books as well. And we also shared office space with a lot of other um, much more kind of experienced illustrators. So we were the junior, <laughs> the junior <laughs> team. And... Uh, then in 1975, I came down with my partner to, to visit some friends in Dartmoor and uh, visited the little town of Chagford. And I thought, oh, I could, I could live here. And my partner felt the same way. <laughs> and we came down for a weekend and we actually stayed for an extra day, looked at some houses and made an offer on one. Uh, which was accepted that same day. So the whole <laughs> idea of moving to the country and choosing a place to live and uh, making a commitment was all done in, in the space of one weekend. <laughs> and then uh, I thought, we won't be able to afford this. We need a lodger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I told Brian about it, and, uh, and Brian thought he'd come down and have a look as well, and he, he fell in love with the place as well. Yeah, because we, we, we shared these premises in Soho, so um, I, I'd work from like nine to six. I'd come in and work there at the desk, and you, you tended to work late at night. Yeah. So uh, I'd be saying goodbye while she was really getting going, so that's how we knew each other there. But uh, I'd been, I don't know, it was four or five years working as a, what we call a jobbing illustrator, doing all sorts of things. But I, really, I thought, I can't do this anymore. I want to do something else. And I just felt a move to the country was really important. So when you said, you know, come down and have a look, so I got on the train and I got on a bus, and the bus went on this wiggly road you know, forever and ever and 
ever. <laughs> Hello, where am I coming to? And I fetched up, uh, you know, where you, where yeah. you live and where I, eventually I lived. Mm. Um, and I uh, and I went. I thought I, I went up into the village square and I went to the pub. And, uh, and I got a pint and I sat there by a fire, an open fire, and just listened to Gwen, who was a barmaid, yeah, yeah. Uh, behind, uh, speaking in this lovely, lilting um, burr, Devonshire yeah. burr. Yeah. And it did feel like being in the shires. I mean, yeah. it did feel that <laughs> step back in time. And, and right there, and I did tell her years later, it was her voice that made me feel I was at home. It just felt like home. But once I got out into the countryside, and then it went, you know, and, and everything um, just sort of spoke to me. So it was looking at, at trees and rocks and landscape. And, but I, when I looked at it, I thought, well, I know what it looks like on the outside. I can see that. But I was trying to figure out what it looked like on the inside. And so in articulating that, suddenly I was drawing trolls and fairies. And also... What, what, what we had was this liberation of space. And what I mean by that, because Bethan and I would do all these various book covers in which you have to leave this weird, strange, empty space at the top to put the title in. Yeah. But so when, when we sort of started down there responding to the landscape, we could fill in that space. Mm. And it was really, really liberating, mm. wasn't it? And was, then it, was, so it a, was it while you were living together in that house, where you still are, mm. Uh, that you were working on fairies? Uh, not quite. So the first things we were offered was a, a book about illust illust yep. British, British illustration. Uh, I think it was Once Upon a Once Time. Once Upon a Time. Yeah. That's right. There was a, a series of uh, books um, published by Ian and Betty, Betty Ballantyne on um, the, the English dreamers about pre-Raphaelites and Arthur Rackham and Edmund yeah. Dulac. And, the um, Peacock Press books. Mm. The Peacock Press books, yeah. And it was quite a kind of an iconic series of, of art books. And, and they had the idea of doing one on contemporary illustrators pursuing the same kind of ideas. And so um, Brian and I were invited along with uh, several other people. And um, it was meant to be like this, uh, just a kind of a show and tell of what we've been doing up to that point. Yes. But... We hadn't we really had kind of didn't really have enough to <laughs> we put do it so we just yeah. did work especially for it. They said we can't pay you. We said that's all right. We'll just do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but I t I took it uh, as an opportunity to actually kind of project myself into the future and think, well, what what books would I like to have illustrated? <laughs> so I did an illustration for the Mabinogian, and one for the Odyssey, and one kind of Norse myth. That's almost story. spooky. Since that's, yeah. those are all books, well, all stories kind of, you went on. Yeah, about. setting my stall out kind of early on. And, uh, Powerful magic. <laughs> I, I put like fake book titles on my because one of the things was <laughs> that about about it is they it, that the publisher discovered that uh, college students were buying these books um, because they were ripping the pages out and putting, yeah. putting them on their. Walls. I was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so so you you didn't have the title of it on the front. You sort of put it around the back. So we always then somehow it's always together. So that was. Yeah. And we were in this once. I was on the front cover. You're on the back. Yeah. I always say that we sandwiched. The best of British we illustration. Did, yes. um, <laughs> then, but it did mean because of our style, we, everybody assumed we were dead at <laughs> <laughs> the, the very beginning. A bit surprised when we would show up yes. quite alive. Yeah. 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 So we then, were, how did fairies come about? Yeah. Well, the same publisher, Ian, Ian Ballantyne and Betty Ballantyne, had um, after this, they really cottoned on to Brian's work quite, you know, I mean, mm. they, they saw the potential in Brian's work. They, um, that was cheaper. They, they, <laughs> they said, we, we're, we're going to, you know, work with you on a book called The Land of Froud. Yes. So Brian just did more and more drawings for that. And um, mm. they, they created a fan club for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Proud of Froud. Proud of Froud. Nobody knew how to pronounce my name, so yeah. that was, that was Proud and of Froud was. The first Delta. member of that Proud of Froud was Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he happened to be a neighbour of Ian and Betty Ballant. <laughs> and, um, and then Ian and Betty published a book called Gnomes by a Dutch illustrator and, and writer and um, wanted to, to follow up, which was very successful. He wanted to follow up with something else and thought about fairies. And then, because Brian and I were living together, we 
kind of put it all into one, you know, one idea to get these these two people working on. Uh, well, I think really, I mean, what we when they came to see us, he had the gnomes book under his arm, and they kept showing it to us, and we looked at it very politely and folded it up and gave it back because it didn't, we what we weren't understanding that we were the follow up to gnomes. We just yeah. thought we were, we were arrogant young men that they were going to do this book uh, about fairies. Of course, we're the right people to do it. But uh, it turns out, well, why they had two people, because it meant they could do it quicker. <laughs> that was one, I think, one of the real reasons. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and then we started to do, do, working on it. We started doing it. And then they looked at what we were doing. And they came back again, because uh, I think they were very worried. Yes, it showed us the, the, the gnomes, gnomes book again. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were expecting it to be all sort of jolly and bright yeah. colours and everything. And we were doing these dark, dingy things with yeah. teeth, <laughs> sharp teeth. <laughs> But, but they, they, thank goodness they went with it. Yeah. And I think what, what the breakthrough is, it wasn't what they wanted, it wasn't what they expected, but we were, we were true to something. We were true to the folklore, we were true to... Um, to the just, landscape. To the landscape. Yeah. And that's why people just really responded to it. Mm. And so, I mean, it was interesting working together, because I remember, that, I don't remember whose floor it was, because I, I sort of moved out at that stage and I was yeah. just up the road, yeah. but we decided we needed to like divide up the images yeah. to each other, and we both got strengths and weaknesses, and so we wrote down the, the, the subjects, the titles, didn't we? I think we put on the floor. Yeah, all, all the possible things that could go into a book on yeah. fairies, and we just divided, took turns in kind of choosing. We laid it on the floor, I think, yeah. and then we just, in turn, we took... Yeah. Yeah. One each, that's, yeah. And then we got to where the, we were sort of a bit, well, I don't know, I really want that one. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And then we were actually in separate houses when we, when we yeah. did it. Yeah. And then we just, uh, well, only by a few yards. I think we yards, checked in on know? each other a, a couple of times yeah. during that thing. That we, it's more, we more or less did it yeah. separately. Yes. Kind of but what together. we try to do is also, and there are, we are, you can tell the difference between what we do. We have different approaches, different styles, but we tried at certain points, like mix it up a bit, mm -hmm. so you couldn't quite tell who yeah. did what. That was the idea, but I think it was, but I think it was a marriage made in <laughs> heaven. Yes. Well, speaking, made of, <laughs> speaking of marriages, I want to get Wendy into this conversation. <laughs> So we need to, I would love to just talk for an hour about fairies because it was so, that book was so influential for so many of us, but we need to move on. <laughs> the, from fairies, you went on to the Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. So can you explain how that happened so we can then jump to Wendy and talk about how you two met? Yeah, uh, well, Jim Henson has seen the book and we, I do think it actually was uh, Once Upon a Time. Um, which was of a, a look up with the first thing I did when I got to Dartmoor, it was, and it was of a, a, a big troll with a waterfall falling off its nose. Uh, and Jim had seen that, and he had an idea for a film, which was become The Dark Crystal. And um, I'd, uh, he, he, and he, he sent somebody to, to see me, and I said, I'm going on holiday. And I, I never go on holiday. I never do. <laughs> and I said, well, I can see you, you know, in this certain, whatever it was, 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm going. So he came into my cottage, the box cottage just up the road, and he walked in and he said, oh, Jim is going to love this. Because <laughs> I sort of made things and figures and everything. And Painted goblins on the wall. Yeah. Um, and so I went to see Jim and I didn't know what to say to him. I was non... Uh, I'd, but you know, he said, would you want to come to New York and work on, the, on this idea? I said, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I fetched up in uh, New, New York, and which uh, where there was Wendy. You can tell your... That's, yeah, let's yeah. get your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> I just moved. I just graduated from art school with a lot of my friends, and we all moved to New York. Um, I grew up in Detroit. And so we all moved to New York and to make our fame and fortune there. And I had a little exhibition of, of dolls and figures that I'd made, a Christmas exhibition in the loft where I was living. And um, ja, the art director for Muppets and for Jim Henson came to that exhibition and bought uh, one of my pieces for his daughter. And he bought a marionette for Jim Henson as a Christmas present. And I thought, well, that's nice. <laughs> and and uh, then just the day after New Year, I got a phone call from Michael Frith, who was the art director, saying, well, 
Jim really loved that piece. Would you like to come in an interview for a new project that he's going to be working on? And I said, yeah, sure, that would be amazing. And uh, he said, well, it's tomorrow. And I said, oh, no, I can't come tomorrow. I've got to pick my mother up at the airport. And he just stopped for a minute and he said, no, you've got somebody else to pick your mother up at the airport. <laughs> this is really important. <laughs> you've got to do this instead. So I said, okay. <laughs> so I went and met Jim, and the first thing he, he was explaining about um, this project, and the first thing he did was show me Once Upon a Time. So he showed me your work, and I'd never seen your work before, and I just was blown away by it. And I thought, this is a project with, with yes, I'll do, I'd love to. So I was hired to do that. And um, I was hired specifically to work on um, the two main characters, Jan and Kira, because I was making, I was making very delicate dolls and things like that, and Jim thought that I would be able to do that well. So that's where I met Brian. I'd been working for about two weeks with six other people, I think, in the workshop, getting ready for Brian to come in. And then Brian walked in one day in a little corduroy suit, <laughs> and he was so quiet and so shy, and he sat in the corner and just sketched, and um, that's how we met. <laughs> then, then as soon as he'd stopped being shy, <laughs> he just never shut up. He was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's bring Alan in. This, at the same time, you were starting to go more into book illustration yeah. with the Mabinogian castles, uh, Peter Dickens and Merlin's dream, yeah. and then famously you got involved with Tolkien's work. How did that happen? Well, yeah, after Fairies, I published um, The Mabinogion. And um, then Ian Ballantyne wanted me to do, do another one, uh, something similar to, 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 to Fairies. So um, we came up with the idea of castles. And then that was published in Britain by the same publisher, Armin Hyman, who were the publishers of Tolkien. Uh, incidentally, Ian Ballantyne is an amazing figure in American publishing, and he was, it was him who produced the first authorised paperback of The Lord of the Rings in, in America. Yeah. And uh, I don't know whether he met Tolkien, but um, he would have probably taken him along to a convention if he could. He was just so <laughs> active in the whole kind of fan community and, and, uh, and a, an amazing person. But, um, but Castles was published by Amwin Hyman, and an editor there, Jane Johnson, um, had, she was working as their kind of fantasy and Tolkien editor, and she had the idea of uh, an illustrated edition of The Lord of the Rings and asked me if I'd like to get involved with that. And I, I had to do some sample drawings for Christopher Tolkien to approve. So I did a little kind of line-up of, of the characters. Mm -hmm. And... Um, He's, he was happy with that. He did ask that if I could just con concentrate more on the landscapes rather than kind of featuring the characters too strongly. So Which I, must have been music to your ears. Yeah, because, um, anyway. you know, having really immersed myself in, in the Devonshire landscape and Dartmoor and so on, you know, everything that I was doing was really kind of based around landscape. And, and that ruined tower there, that's actually kind of based on the little... Yeah. A little ruined tower at the top of a in a wood at the top of a hill, just overlooking our town, and um, so I was kind of yeah immersing myself in the, in, in the landscape, and I wanted to um, really follow the the fellowship by concentrating on the landscapes, and often the people are very kind of small in the, trekking their way through, and. Um, so I produced 50 illustrations for The Lord of the Rings, and it was published in 1992 as Tolkien's Centenary Edition. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the, uh, the whole Tolkien thing. And um, can we get, I want to get a little deeper here, because we could do, just do a year by year, what did you do then, what did you yeah. do then? But we have this opportunity, of the three of you together, to talk a little bit about the ideas and the vision and the passion behind these well, things. Uh, so jump I, in there, Brian. Uh, well, it was interesting about the landscape, because I remember years ago there was a showing of uh, Dark Crystal in Paris, and afterwards there was questions, and somebody said, well, why does uh, Dark Crystal look like Lord of the Rings? 
<laughs> and I thought, oh my God, and I thought, no, wait a minute, I did, we, we did this first. So, so. And then I said, ah, it's because both Alan and I live in the same place. Um, and, and as artists, I think it's essential that you are informed by your own landscape, where you live. You know, even if, not just countryside, but in urban thing as well, you know, is that you need to respond to it and tell it and somehow tell its story. And so, um, you know, so it, the Lord of the Rings, it, where we live, shows up in it because it's, I mean, the way I paint and draw, it's because of the rhythm of trees and there's that feeling. And, and I was, we were talking, weren't we, the other, other day, and I was really excited to discover that you, you know, you had taken, well, you should tell this, the photographs of trees and textures and that had been scanned in for the end. For the, yes, that's right. The, yeah, the process of, um, of creating CG characters, you make the model and then you kind of skin it with basically reference photos mm. or textures. For the film work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for the films. And uh, so I'd, I'd taken photographs of, of the local trees and, mm. and they were used to kind of uh, create the textures for the trees in, in the yeah. world. But it's, it's so important to root. I mean, I call yeah. root everything, fantasy. It's got to be rooted in, in a reality. Mm. And, and also, I think it's that, that, you know, we're lucky to live in a, in a landscape, and you're living in a landscape where, where, you know, that's why, like, fairies and, uh, are so close to the surface. <laughs> it's because uh, the, the landscape itself is telling its own story, you know. So. And yet you're creating fantasy worlds that aren't necessarily about Dartmoor. No. So no, you're, yeah. you're, for instance, with the Tolkien work, you're, you're taking your relationship to... a landscape in a very different part of Britain yeah. into Tolkien's imaginary world which was informed by his Oxfordshire landscape but yeah. is also not Oxfordshire yeah. and then when you went on to the film work you're also in a very different landscape in New Zealand yeah can you talk about that a little bit about how how you respond to all those different things in one piece of work um I'm not sure that I can really kind of <laughs> ra rationalise it. Um, it's just I'm so kind of steeped in the in the local landscape that the way I think of trees and, and draw trees, it's it's um, it's all informed by you know months and months and years of walking, sketching, photographing. Does Dartmoor remain dominant even when you're? working in New Zealand, for instance, or for you guys when you're working in New York or London on film and television work? Is it is it still Dartmoor that's inspiring you, or is it the local it landscape? It is. I mean, the, the, the New Zealand land, the landscapes were, were wonderful, and they're, um, they're very grand. I mean, they're, they're landscapes that you kind of stand back and, ad, and admire. And uh, But there's something about the... Uh, the local landscapes that make you want to kind of crawl into them in mm. a way. And uh, I just love kind of, yeah, pushing through undergrowth and... Well, we worked in Langley and, and Slough. <laughs> 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 wasn't much going on there that was really very inspiring. <laughs> so we brought the landscape with us. Yeah. By which... Well, it was working the, on uh, the, the Age of Resistance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... But when I was first... Dartmoor came with us. First of all, in New York, um, that mm. my my uh, the countryside was was Central Park and that was a bit scary in those days. But <laughs> you know, I was expecting you know people with prams and everything, but it was people with big ghetto blasters and things. But um, so I I mean I um, lapsed into just having lobster dinners because um, I I found my nature in a lobster shell, <laughs> which is sort of true. You know, that some of the, like a lobster dinner shows up quite. In the in the shapes and forms of uh, dark crystal. Well, the Gartha <laughs> were were lobsters. They basically. were really yes. But Brian would come in um, every morning from wherever, whatever dinner he'd had the night before in the <laughs> workshop in in New York, with you know either lobster shells or just things he'd picked up, and then he'd start putting them together. And we would all it was fascinating to watch him because we were all doing pretty, I don't know, interesting things, but he would top us by doing even more interesting things and then saying, look at this. And it would turn into the orrery or it would turn into yeah. just you know, a, a maquette of a little creature that nobody had seen before. And uh, 
we were that was very inspiring. Almost sometimes more than uh, more than your drawings, because it was this thing that you just created, and because we were three dimensional artists, uh, to have you be able to do that too, and show us what you meant by what we should be doing in a way. Well, I, I sort of well. realised it was a long journey we were, we were mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah, we had five years to work on uh, the Dark We didn't know it would so take it that a... long, but, um, <laughs> but... No, it was it was a blessing. But it was, but because it was pu puppets, we were pushing the boundaries of how you do that um, from the very beginning. And so, and what we knew that they had to be real, you had to believe them, you had to believe that they had life and character. And so we were trying to figure out how to do that and so me just doing a drawing is not enough. It's got to, it, we got to dimensionalize it. And so um, luckily I did have, well, I learned on the job. I didn't know how to do all these skills, but I, I learned more how to like make things. And also suddenly um, in sculpting, I couldn't do it myself. I had to hand it on to other people because I couldn't do all the sculpting myself and learn how to articulate that. But then how to, I had to make a whole world um, out of uh, one with, with, that had some things, of some resonances that we'd sort of seen before, but other, otherwise it was something we'd never experienced before. So it literally, I mean, we always, we always conceptualise it as, a, as like a miniature planet. So every single thing you saw on the screen uh, had to really relate to each other, had to, be, had to feel as part of the s same world. And so... Um, the, the way to do that was like fi try and filter it through me. Mm -hmm. um, although we had all these wonderful, talented people, I had to make sure it kept moving into my my vision, and that brought it together. I then um, brought geometry in, some sort of weird geometry, and we, so that sort of was the glue that held the whole world, this the, the world of the dark crystal, together. So everything then always related to it, whether it be a plant or a rock, you know, a tree or a creature, always felt that they, they were the same. I think at the beginning, um, there were so few of us working on it that we became really in sync with each other. And it was interesting because we were working basically in one big room together, more or less, and we could talk to you, we could talk to each other, we could all see what, what each other was doing, and which doesn't really happen that often now. Um, but then Jim would come in, and Frank Oz as well, and they would talk about their vision. Jim especially had visions for it, but he was very good at letting everybody express what they felt they needed to express. And then he always, of course, had the right to say, no, not this time. This isn't what we want. But, but usually, you know, there would be ways to work so that it satisfied you. And I think the Gelflings, in a way, were the most difficult because they were the most human characters and everybody had a different vision. Jim wanted them to be very heroic. Brian wanted them to be more like little elves. And uh, that, was, that was difficult. I went through loads and loads of different, different versions of them to finally come to something that they agreed on. Uh, mm. But yeah, it was amazing to... That collaborative that. way of creating oh. things is so interesting compared to when you're in your studio creating paintings. Or but sculptures. we still, yeah, we, we collaborate all the time, and now we've been together for yeah. well over 40 years. And I think our work um, is, we, is really helped by each other's visions. I know that I love more than anything looking at Brian's paintings and sometimes he'll bring something out at the end of the day, a painting that he's finished, and we'll sit in the kitchen and have a glass of wine, and he'll say, I don't know who this is. Do you? And then I said, yeah, I do. I know exactly who that is. And I can write about that. So then I, I write something about it, and then I think, but it would be even more fun if I could just three-dimensionalize it so then I can turn it into a character that not only is in a painting, but that has stepped out of the painting, and you see it in front of you. And it's magic. Mm. It's magic when that happens, but... Um, what was it yeah. like for you, Alan, when I mean, you created all this Tolkien work and, and other beautiful illustrations for other books? And I know you as someone in your barn studio, you know, alone, working alone, odd hours of the night, taking long walks in the woods and then come back and working alone. And, but when I, yeah. your film work is completely different. 
Well, it's, yeah, working with hundreds, literally hundreds of other people, mm. um, uh, yeah, it kind of forces you to be much more sociable and mm. try and communicate a little bit, a little bit better. I mean, I remember when you first went off to New Zealand, and we thought you'd be gone for <laughs> a, a year, and that seemed so long. And it was what seven years you, in the end? Um, more than yeah, they more than that? they invited me out for six months, and I ended up <laughs> staying for, for six years on the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> And I was almost yeah. the last person working on it. Peter had moved on to King Kong by the time I finished because mm -hmm. I, was, I was kind of involved with every aspect of the, the design and ended up designing the packaging for the collector's <laughs> <laughs> edition to the DVD and stuff like that and the menus for the uh, DVDs. And, and uh, so, yeah, it was a very long, very long process. And um, but I, and I loved working with, I love working with people who are as enthusiastic as I am about something. Mm. You know, even to that's an extent good, that's really, where that's, like, that's really important. Mm. And yeah, you really kind of feed on that on yeah. the energy, and it just gives you you know so much more confidence to kind of keep keep going. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of found uh, working on, on on my films is that. Um, what I always think is necessary is a benign dictatorship, and I'm the di dictator, <laughs> but uh, that's not always possible. So what, what, what you have to do is to get everybody to speak the same language, and, and then, they, then they can put their sentences together, then they can write whole stories, and, and they, they, they make true contributions to, to a world that uh, becomes seamless. Because there's nothing worse of like working in a group, you know, or film, and somebody like does this thing, puts this thing in, and you, as an artist, you go, "Oh my God, it's really wrong shape, and it's fluorescent, and it's the wrong, everything about it is wrong, and nobody else is noticing it, but you do. You, it's a, it's offensive, <laughs> and, you, and so, but you, but it's not their fault. It's because they haven't understood the vocabulary, and once you get them to do that, it's it's then it's a joy to work in a collaborative. Yeah, but I think sometimes people do notice things like that, but they don't know that they're noticing it. But you, you see something, it's either, uh, you know, a painting or you see a film or... And it just doesn't, it doesn't feel quite right. It, it, Whereas a film that has coherence. Mm. Yes. Because it's a coherency yeah. of vision. Mm. Or, or an illustration or a painting or a sculpture that, you know, you can kind of let your breath out and relax because you know you're safe with it for some reason. But if it doesn't work, if it's not quite... I don't know how to explain that. I think because we, we actually pull our things from, from another world into this world and then turn them into something that other people can see. It's like people remembering something that they knew at some point mm -hmm. and had forgotten. And that's when you know that, you know that you've touched something true. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? But yes, no, yeah. it, I, I do feel we, we bring, if it, when it's successful, you've actually, it's not really, you don't own it, nothing to do with you, you've just been facilitating it, and it comes from somewhere else. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That is a really important point, because there, there are going to be young artists, young filmmakers, young writers watching this talk, wondering, but how do I do this? How do I get to be you? How do I get to create that kind of career? And they're going... And I know that what would be lovely for them is to give you a step by step by step. You do this, you do this. This is how you get an agent. This is what you do. Except that it doesn't, that work, it. It doesn't work that way. What does work is having a vision and to see your vision as a gift you're giving the world and find ways to keep giving that gift over and over again. It certainly is. A, it's a vocation. It's not just a job. Um, we, we all have to really love what we do. Mm. Um, Thinking about those young artists and yeah. young would-be filmmakers, they're hearing a story of success that you went from this to this to this and it was all smooth and you were helped with every <laughs> step of the way. And yeah. I know that that's not uh, yeah. the case. I know that there was a stretch where you had two successful films out, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and a best-selling book in fairies, and you wanted to do more work on fairies and publish it, and no publisher would touch it. Fairies aren't, you know, no, fairies won't yeah. sell. Nobody wants you know, to read a book. You went through a really dark period 
in yeah, getting that, that, that was for looking the, the, the period of looking for coins down the back of the sofa. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, and you, uh, you know, money. we talk about you going to New Zealand for all those years. You also really struggled with leaving your community and your family behind. And there were there were hard aspects to this. What kept you all going during those periods? Yeah, I mean, when I look back at, uh, you know, working on The Lord of the Rings and, and The Hobbit, I can, it's very kind of rosy in, in retrospect because you just remember the, the good things. Mm. But, uh, but I also remember feeling, you know, almost every day that I, I wasn't quite, I was kind of failing at some level because it was just such a, such a huge project. It was like a great kind of locomotive kind of bearing down on me. And mm. I'm just trying to kind of keep keep one step ahead. Just it's um, yeah, just trying to uh, stop being kind of crushed by this juggernaut. And I mean, nothing bad would have happened if I had failed to kind of um, produce enough drawings in a, in a day. But uh, I would have felt that, or I'd kind of failed to actually make that that window look as elfish as it <laughs> as it could have been, you know. Um, but it came at personal cost. I remember you coming yeah. back to Chagford periodically to you know be with your family over the holidays yeah. and stuff, yeah. and everyone was so eager to see you, and you would be just exhausted. <laughs> You'd just yeah. fall asleep yeah. in the middle of anything. Oh well, that's yeah. Yeah, jet lag. It was, yeah. Yeah. It, it was a labor. It wasn't just a labor of love. It was a labor yeah. Yeah. to do and that. I, I did work very long hours, particularly on on the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I kind of worked mm -hmm. till late every every night and and very often at weekends as well. So my question yeah. is for all of you, and I know you've gone through difficult, difficult times with your work and with your health, and just what keeps you going? Because you, for example, when you could not get your work out there, publishers didn't want to know, you still, you wouldn't do the work they wanted you to do. It's like, if you, no, that's, if that's you did witches, if you did giants, we'd publish that. It's like, uh, yeah. no, no, I'm no. painting fairy I'm, right now. I'm, 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 especially um, when we've had some exhibitions of, uh, of our work in, in New York, you know, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that nobody wants to buy my paintings. I just think, <laughs> I think I must be doing something right. True. Well, they buy. <laughs> well, actually, the, the weird thing about the ones that uh, do, do sell, they're always the ones I think, well, nobody's ever going to buy that. Uh, they all turn out to be people we know, <laughs> mainly, have no money. Yeah, that's it, interesting. Um, mm. But it's really important that they should somehow own this painting. And they're, they're, they're paintings that are challenging, um, um, but, but it speaks to them. And that's what, when my work is actually at its best, it is about having a conversation with the other. Mm. Um, absolutely. Um, and, and that's not popular and it's not comfortable it's not something you just hang on the wall but it's true it's true it's and it's something that you have to have a, all I all I ever paint is something you should have a relationship with it and also with something that um, shifts and changes that it's not static that it's not and that's 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 my style I mean it's interesting to see people that work in fantasy how uh, a lot of it to me is overwrought it's over done it's too shiny and there's no no space to get in and Charlie my... Charlie Vess was talking about that this morning yeah. about pictures that don't leave space for it's... what he called poetic space well that's yeah, the... oh that's so important yeah I think for everything if you don't give the person who is looking at it or enjoying it space to be involved with it and mm. be a part of it and bring something and of bring themselves. something of themselves to it yeah, yeah. that 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 just makes all the difference mm. and I think I feel like that about things that I make yeah. oops for people um, that they have to have a relationship with it. And it's the same thing when they have pieces of mine. They don't just put them on a shelf and forget them. They're things that they tend to interact with. And it's important. But I think the reason, I think the reason we keep going is because we have an, a need to create that never stops. Mm. We just need to create in, in any way. I mean, so many things are creative. Cooking is creative. Making singing, a family. Making, yeah. Being in community is creative. But, <laughs> um, but I don't think we would exist without being able to create or be creative in some way. Well, I want meaning, I suppose. Um, 
Uh, oh, meaning. What's well, I, <laughs> well, I don't know. That's the struggle. Is that I mean, I, I mean, I, I find that physically, I'm not I'm mentally. I'm not. I can't just do something. I can't go the easy route. It's always some sort of difficult thing. But I really want it. Everything I do to have meaning. But I'm not. But I don't. But that's the struggle. So, uh, but I you work, don't define that. Meaning. No. When you I worked leave on it open um, for yeah, um, good to fairies, define. bad fairies. I work huge body of work. I hardly ever came into the village because if I did came into the village, I had my head hung low. I was ashamed. I thought my work is terrible. You know, nobody's going to want to look at this. And when you look back on it, you think, "Oh my goodness, how did I do that?" You know, because <laughs> painting a picture is a, is, a, is a historical document. It's a, a moment in time mm. um, that, that hopefully transcends. But um, and so, um, but there's still something. Yeah, that, that into that keeping going is quite. Is hard. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful. The, the most astonishing thing uh, is that I, I've gotten you know what I'm saying is we've gone through all our careers not having to get another job. Um, <laughs> yeah. that we've actually existed under our own talents yeah. to create art. Although we've all felt like we've had, we should maybe go <laughs> work in a wonderful we, hardware shop at our village because. You know, it would be fun, and it would, and we wouldn't have to think so much. Yeah, it's an easier transaction. <laughs> is that is to fix something, uh, oh, yeah. and then you get paid for it. It's like yeah, so and then easy. you can just you go, go yeah. home and not have to think about it yeah. anymore. But, but actually, but, but no, also, we're driven to do what we do. So there's also the res do. responsibility you have to the gift of what's coming through you. I mean, all three of you, I see you relating to the. To landscape, I'm going to bring yeah. it back to mm. that again. Relating to the land, and I'm by that not just. Not just the tangible land, but the, the otherness of it, the more than human quality of it, yeah. the animals, the trees, the, the things that we don't know how to express, expect, yeah. um, the numinous qualities of the landscape. Yeah. And when that is what's fueling your work, to stop doing that work feels like, mm. feels wrong because you, you are expressing something that's not of yourselves yeah. entirely. Mm -hmm. And that gift, May Sarton talks about how the gift blocked up is is the most painful thing in the world. If she was talking about having writer's block, and when the gift right. the gift is blocked, how how do you live in the world with that pain? And in all of you, you keep that gift that you of what you give to the world, that communication from this other place yeah. that goes out to the world. You keep there's it flowing. A, there's a mechanical oh, we, aspect to, to drawing it. and painting, which kind of um, helps with that with the. With the blockage, the fact that you've, you've you've got the piece of paper in front of you and you've started to kind of make a few lines on it, and a deadline and, nagging at you, <laughs> and well, fear plays a huge part. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of, um, yeah, the fear of, um, of of annoying the the wonderful editor or art director who's committed you, <laughs> no. uh, just kind of uh, yeah, not not making the deadline, um, failing in some way. Failing to kind of make make a living, and you know, um, you always push it down. Yeah, <laughs> it's just that, that's a huge part of it. But I, I think the the main one of the main things for me, it, as well as the love of landscape, is the uh, the immersion in stories, and um, and not just illustrating one particular story at one particular time, but having a kind of like a lifelong relationship with stories, like you know, mm -hmm. the Welsh, the Celtic legends in the Mabinogi and that wasn't just something I did for two years it's mm. kind of a lot it's a lifelong love of that material I like that and word I'm you still, use relationship yeah lifelong relationship with story yeah and the, that's the, true of all three of you yeah well I found it amazing to find the new stories that come out mm. of out of fairy out of out of that other world and yeah. to, to just pull them out and then have them in front and say yeah that works. That is you. It is a new story from that same place, mm. and, uh, and that's very satisfying. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of make, it's making a connection, really, isn't mm. it? And and feeling that you're connected with that tradition of storytelling and image making. That lineage, yeah, because there is always well. a connection. Mm. Yeah, that lineage yeah. in our field where yeah. you know the people who have gone before. You hope that you're adding to that conversation yeah. that will encourage and inspire the people mm. coming after. Yeah. You three have certainly done that. But being part so. of that conversation yeah. must yeah. be one of the things that keeps you going. Oh, definitely. 
Yes. Well, that's I think is why it's so emotional to be part of this wonderful exhibition. I mean, to see yeah, that, really, to to, just, to, yeah. to see our work in context, but also in the historical context is is astonishing. But that's what I mean. We'd always hope for. We you know we looked back uh, at the influences of writers and uh, and artists, and and we, what we intended to do was to take that energy. And, ro and root it in the present, so it could then go into the future, and that's what you know. To, to arrive this time of our lives, to to, to discover, we did it. Yes. We really did Aww. that. I know. It's, now it's we're like very the moving. Of all of this. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> it is really weird. It's really strange. We were we, young yesterday. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, we're still young inside. <laughs> There's a wonderful, I want to read a wonderful quote. We're getting close to the end here. So I want to read a wonderful quote by Ben Opry about storytellers, which all three of you are, that I think applies to all three of you beautifully. Storytellers ought not to be too tame. They ought to be wild creatures who function adequately in society, but they are best in disguise. If they lose all their wildness, they cannot give us the truest joys. So <laughs> I see, all, that was Ben Oakry, by the way, a <laughs> wonderful writer. Um, all three of you have kept your wildness through all these years, through all this work, and allowed that wildness to go out into your work, to touch on the wildness in the people who watch your films, read your books, pour over your paintings like I did years ago as a university student mm, before I yeah. ever met you. Um, I think it's a, that to me is one of the big gifts you give to the world. Yeah, my, I, I always want to say when people stand close to my art and the, you know, they, a picture painting is like, stand back because this, this works dangerous. <laughs> uh, and that's the best thing I think you could say about a piece of work is that it's not a safe place to be. I mean, it's, when painting it, it's not a safe place to be. That's but, what Ursula Le Guin says about fantasy. Right. That fantasy is a dangerous place and, and yeah. you should not take it lightly. Oh, but that's, that's what makes it so enticing. It's the yeah. thing about it that makes it fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we just also haven't really grown up that much. <laughs> <laughs> that's true too. I think that's a large part of it. Yeah, yeah just uh, you know, you start this journey as a in childhood with stories that yeah. um, have a, a visceral impact on you. Yeah. you know, mm. it's just kind of a, a complete kind of emotion, and just from the words "once upon a time," you're in a wood. Yeah. And uh, mm. and yeah. you're, re you're really there, and I still feel that you know when I'm reading something new or old, so that kind of excitement and immersion, and uh, the feeling of drawing from this great kind of well mm. of experience. And, yes, absolutely. That. And knowledge. There's certainly stories out there that have saved me, and the mm. thought that anything that we could do might ha foster that same experience mm. in someone else. Yeah. I find very moving. Mm. And we're very, I think we're all very grateful to have been able and are still able to do that. Mm. It's really yeah. important to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, we've been lucky. Yeah. And we've been lucky to do it in community. And you know, we've- Oh, we live in the best place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been, been on this journey together for yeah. so many years, so many decades now. And that's mm. something to be grateful for, too. Yeah. All right, that's we it. are one, almost out of time, so I'm going to end with one more quote, which is by, from Barry Lopez. Everything is held together by stories. That is all that is holding us together, stories and compassion. Thank you for your oh. stories. Wow. Thank you.